As I indicated in part one, I think it will be helpful to young cellists preparing themselves for orchestral auditions to have a discussion of some symphonic excerpts. I have based my selections on the frequency of their appearance on audition lists, as well as on stylistic and technical considerations that are applicable to many similar compositions. Starting with Bach's third Brandenburg concerto, we encounter the Anapests, short, short, long, that we discussed before in the scale bowings. <laughs> The second excerpt from the first movement points up a recurring problem, particularly in Baroque music, the proper division of the bow length as we alternate legato and detaché strokes. The answer lies in playing several detached notes in the same direction without making them sound different from bow strokes going back and forth. <laughs> Merrily dancing second movement should avoid all heaviness on the detaché notes. We may wish to leave the string slightly using the elasticity of the modern bow to create a shallow bounce. <laughs> Mozart's music, I wish to isolate two problems. One, the phrase groupings combining swift legato and staccato notes that we meet, for instance, in the finale of the symphony number no. 39 in E flat. For the 16th notes, we must use arm impulses only on the first legato notes. <laughs> The same light arm weight and precise control through wrist and fingers helps us in innumerable similar passages in all styles. The second point I wish to emphasize is the need for extreme lightness of the bow and the most even left hand articulation in fast, soft legato passages, like the ones in the finale of the Hafner Symphony. <laughs> and in the Figaro Overture. From Beethoven's symphonies, the slow moment of the fifth is a perennial audition choice. Piano dolce, the 32nd notes, rhythmic without disturbing the legato. On some celli, the use of the open A string will be all right, however, to avoid its possible lack of blending with the other notes, I suggest fingerings that use higher positions. In the trio of the scherzo, 
the eighth notes should not rumble and must have a chance to grow toward the half note G. In the piano, after letter B, they must become steadily lighter. <laughs> The dotted rhythms in the first moment of Beethoven's Seventh Symphony continue to be a problem, even in very good orchestras. There is a tendency, particularly in the long sequences, to turn the rhythm yam param pam param into tam taram pam piram. This could be avoided by one at all, I think, if it were determined that the three notes admit musically and mechanically of only one impulse on the first note. It is the accent on the last note that advances it, advances it toward becoming a duplet. The Siciliano rhythm offers us three possible executions. One, we can play the first two notes down bow and the third one up. Two, go back and forth from note to note. Before the first fermata, the first way is preferable. I like going back and forth in the pianissimo before letter F. Also, the entire crescendo towards letter H and the passage beginning 10 measures before letter I can avoid duplets by not hooking the 16th, but at H and I, we should hook. And then there is a third way that can be used to good advantage in a slower tempo. One note down and two up. The first theme from Beethoven's third piano concerto profits from this bowing. So does the last moment of his fifth cello sonata. You may also be asked, to play the melody at letter A in the second movement. Lift the bow before the grace notes and play them on the beat, but without accents. In the trio of the menuet of the eighth Beethoven symphony, our triplets accompany a gentle horn solo. They must be very even and delicate. Even the Sforzandi should not be exaggerated. Problems of fingering have to be balanced against those of string crossings. <laughs> Thank you. 
Incidentally, I think it is better to use only four cellists and have them articulate the triplets in a soft but distinct chamber music style than to shush ten cellists into total obliteration. Triplets that are much faster but again have to reconcile left and right hand problems occur in the last moment of Schubert's great C major symphony. It is easiest for me to use the thumb both in C major and later in E flat. <laughs> For a crisp execution of the extended passages with dotted rhythms, I prefer an up, down, up, down, up bowing, hooking only the last two notes. <laughs> As we come to the romantic repertoire, the choices are limitless. Let us start by looking at just two Brahmsian examples. The slow movement from the second symphony is on every audition list. What is required here is the long arched phrase, four quarters under one breath. Brahms uses his favorite dynamic marking, poco forte, meaning sing but don't shout. To avoid cutting up the phrases, we must go into the bow changes without the diminuendo and without altering the bow speed. Much more intimate, tender and wistful is the mezza voce melody in the third movement of the third symphony. As in the fifth Beethoven, the 32nd notes must be articulated within a perfect legato. If anyone asks for the overture to Smetana's Bartered Bride, it is probably to find out about the player's rhythmic steadiness in the first four measures. This is best safeguarded by a bow arm moving fluently a la breve and sharp accents in both hands on the seas, while a metronome inside us beats relentless quarters to keep the eighth notes precise. Tchaikovsky's symphonic works are full of interesting cello passages. First, two excerpts from the Fourth Symphony. Use only one arm impulse per beat in the dotted rhythms of the first movement. 
The second movement in modo di canzone, like a song, is graceful and simple. The celli opened the second moment of the Pathétique Symphony smoothly and elegantly. The third movement needs a sharply chiseled throne bow, the arm almost motionless in pianissimo, opening up with the crescendos. From Debussy's La Mer, the passage at number nine is often required audition material. The style asks for sweeping movements of the bow arm and abrupt articulations by the fingers on the 16th notes. <laughs> Realize the rhythms in the first two and all similar measures of Prokofiev's classical symphony, one always ought to start the repeated 16th notes on a downbow. This will enable the arm to stop sharply on the longer notes without leaving the string and to be ready for the concluding note. <laughs> I want to cite the end of Kabalievsky's Colas Brognon Ouverture as an example of a very fast orchestra passage needing stable left hand positions to obtain clean results from the whole cello section. I suggest therefore that we ascend on the D string all the way to number 57. The thumb is securely anchored on C from four measures before 57 to three measures before 59. A 
Eventually, one has to study all of Richard Strauss' tone poems. They appear in turn on audition lists and are too difficult to sight read. For now, we shall have to confine ourselves to Don Juan, the one most frequently asked for. Let us start with the solo passage 12 measures after letter V. Cover the fifth B F sharp with the first finger and use a small rubbing stroke in the middle of the bow as softly as possible. For me, it is best to start the 16th on an apple, sustain the half note, and after a slight separation, continue the triplet at the tip with another down bow. The 16th follow this pattern with increasing intensity to letter W. <laughs> Now, I think we should play the opening the same way. As is so often the case when short strokes and string crossings are involved, it is not wise to imitate the violins who usually prefer to start the 16th on a dumbo. <laughs> Divide the scale into four notes and seven notes, the way Strauss wrote it five measures before letter C. And the triplet should have a common thumb for the high and the low position. Uh, it's not a question of stretching, because if you played it a half step farther apart, it would still be the same technique. Now, at letter A. Set the bow firmly on the low B. finger falls on the third beat, the impact must send the first finger one half step back. Again. Dotted rhythms ought to keep their 16s short and not let them become triplets, and there ought to be a slight lift before them. Uh, seven measures before letter G, let us phrase to the second and the fourth beats so there will not be a diminuendo during the 16th notes. Senza espressivo. We're getting a little faster. Now, seven measures after O. but keep the eighth notes well in the string. Here we don't open up the hand, but pounce upon the closed second position. Uh, keep that F sharp uh, to place the D next to it. In the following Grazioso passage, the bounced triplet notes 
ask for a light bow hold but by a firm attack on the string. The grace notes, on the other hand, need a martelet setting, which always means a stronger bow hold. <laughs> And finally, letter R. Don't use too much bow on the triplet notes, so, and keep the bow pressure even. Uh, at the frog. Uh, old bow. Young string players may be tempted to dismiss performance accuracy in the music of Strauss as being secondary to a sweeping and lush style. But the auditioning conductors know all too well that much of the brilliance of their orchestras depends on the excellent rhythm, articulation, and intonation of their string sections. With dozens of accomplished cellists vying for admittance at every important audition, none of the ingredients of accuracy can be slighted. If you can then add the vibrancy and sensitivity of your personality and the beauty of your sound and phrasing, you will surely succeed sooner or later in becoming a happy contributor to the glories of the symphonic literature.